Good afternoon. So, our subject is EMT, electromagnetic waves and transmission lines, which is there as a part of our gate syllabus. So, with respect to the gate, sir, if you see the weightage of the subject, EMT has got weightage around 7 to 9 marks. 7 to 9 marks. If you look at this weightage of 7 to 9 marks, I am sure means out of this total weightage, because this is basically the nature of the subject is problem oriented. Many times we can see problems in the gate examination. So, means the means we have theory but the much weightage, we have applications of the theory with respect to the problems. So, in the gate examination, mostly what we are getting the problems. So, I am sure when many of the problems are directly, means, means many of the problems are directly based on the formulas. So, here we have to words, uh, see or uh, we have to keep more concentration towards the concepts and the different type of formulas what we will be deriving and then, okay, so the different type of problems on those concepts. So, that is how, sir, we try to learn each and every concept and we see the different words or type of expressions related to the concepts and we apply those concepts and those formulas to the or different problems, different problems. So, that is how means basically we can understand the weightage of this subject with respect to the gate. Next, when you, what's a coming to the syllabus here, coming to the syllabus, when you look at the syllabus, so it basically starts from first the fundamentals of what's a fields, begins with the concepts of vectors. So, first we begin with the concepts of vectors, vector analysis, why we require vector analysis to understand fields and the different type of what's a operations performed on the vectors and the different type of words, or what operators like del vector differential operator and the concept of gradient with respect to a scalar and what's concept of <coughs> divergence and the physical significance of divergence and finally, the curl, curl of a vector and what is the physical significance of curl of a vector and the different type of words or even what operations like scaling of vectors, addition of vectors, multiplication of vectors, the different type of operations and all that we will be seeing. Once we have done with the vectors, we will be moving on to the next part called the coordinate systems. To represent a three dimensional field, okay, we have some basic references with respect to this coordinate systems. So, that is why first means once we finish with this vectors, we begin with the concept of coordinate systems. So, we will see the different type of coordinate systems like rectangular coordinate system, cylindrical coordinate system and spherical coordinate system and what is the relationship between all of them. And once we have seen this what is the coordinate systems and vector fundamentals, we begin with our real syllabus called electrostatics. So, as a part of the electrostatics, first we will see okay, what is a stationary electric field or what is a static electric field, how it is produced and what are the laws governing those static electric fields like the first concept we will see called Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law and the applications of Coulomb's law and next we go for the other concept called electric field intensity and next we will see what is the Gauss law, I mean electric flux and electric flux density and Gauss law. As a part of the Gauss law, we will be getting our Maxwell first equation, Maxwell first equation and then we go the other concept as a part of our electrostatics is called electric potential and when we look at sir, the previous gate questions, many times the emphasis in electrostatics will be given to the Gauss law and electric potential. There are many, many previous gate questions with respect to these two topics. So, that is why we say these are given what is at most importance as a part of electrostatics. So, we will see electric potential and what is electric potential, what is the relationship between electric potential and electric field, okay, 
and various problems on it. And once we have done with that, we go other part of the electrostatics. Well, how do we classify the materials? Like what are conducting materials? What are insulators? Okay, our dielectrics, perfect dielectrics. What are their properties? And the different words of last related to the conductors, like continuity equation, the importance of the continuity equation, relaxation time, and the properties of dielectrics and the properties of conductors. And once we have done with, we'll see an important concept called the boundary conditions related to the electric field. And once we have done with boundary conditions of electric field, then okay, we'll be going for the other concept as a part of electrostatics and given utmost importance is called the what concept of capacitance. Capacitance. So what is this capacitance? What happens when what's a, what is a parallel plate capacitor? What happens if the parallel plate capacitors are connected in series? What happens they are in parallel? What is the equivalent capacitance? And what do you mean by composite parallel plate capacitor? Like that, the different type of capacitors will be analyzing. And once we have done that, sir, so mostly we'll be finishing the concepts of electrostatics and then begin as a part of what's a magnetostatics. As a part of magnetostatics, so first we'll see what is magnetic field. The various basic terminology related to the magnetic field we learn, like what is magnetic field, what is magnetic field intensity, what is magnetic flux, what is magnetic flux density, and the two laws which are governing our magnetostatics called Bayard Savart law and Ampere circuit law. And we understand also all those what laws, we try to analyze them, and then okay, we'll be what's seeing the applications of Ampere circuit law with that we'll be getting our Maxwell, what's the third equation. I said basically the Gauss law, from Gauss law we get Maxwell first equation. And from the concept of electric, electrostatic potential, you'll be getting Maxwell second equation. And from Ampere circuit law, we'll be getting Maxwell third equation. And then, when we are, sir, next concept, we'll see the properties of magnetic field. From that, you'll be getting a Maxwell fourth equation. So with that, okay, all four Maxwell equations will be finished. And then as a part of magnetostatic, sir, We'll see other concepts called, when similar to the electric concepts, what we have seen, like what electric boundary conditions. Similarly, here boundary conditions related to the magnetic field, and the, what's the other concept called the concept of inductance. Inductance similar to the capacitance in the case of our electrostatic fields. So here we have what's a now magnet inductance with respect to the what magnetostatic fields. So with that, we'll be finishing the pure core part of our what's a electrostatics and magnetostatics. And once we have done with that, we'll be starting with the other concept called, and the most important, which is the basic to derive any wave equations or the Maxwell equations for time varying fields. Maxwell equations for time varying fields. And we'll derive all what's Maxwell equations for time varying fields. And we try to understand their importance. And then they are the beginning for whatsoever wave equations. So after that, we'll see what is a wave, what is an electromagnetic wave, how it is characterized, what is a wave equation in terms of electric field, what is the wave equation in terms of magnetic field. And then, so we'll see a concept called uniform plane wave. And once we have seen uniform plane wave, then we'll be analyzing what's a, so the propagation of that uniform pl plane wave through different mediums. The first, we'll see the propagation of that uniform plane wave through free space, and x through what, sir, uh, means the perfect dielectric medium other than free space. And then next we see what <coughs> the propagation of that uniform plane wave through lossy dielectric medium or practical dielectric medium, and then through perfect conducting medium. Through various media we analyze, and with respect to the medium and wave properties also will be analyzing in detail. Like what is the velocity of the wave through any medium? What is the intrinsic impedance of a medium? What is the propagation constant of a medium? What is attenuation constant? What is phase constant? So like that, so different parameters will be analyzing with respect to the oh, different mediums when a wave is being propagated. So once we have done with the words of wave propagation, next we'll be going for the, means the other concept like related to the wave concept called normal incidence and oblique incidence. So there we try to understand what is the concept of our reflection coefficient and transmission coefficient, 
okay uh, what is standing wave when does the standing wave results what is standing wave ratio and okay what is the polarization so the different type of polarization will be analyzing as a part of public incidence and once we have done with that sir we'll be going the other and again important part of the EMT is the transmission lines we'll see what is the transmission line what are the different types of transmission lines we have what are the examples of it what are the primary concept of transmission lines what are the secondary concepts of the transmission line and so we'll be analyzing a finite length and infinite length transmission line we understand what is the importance of characteristic impedance and we'll be analyzing about different types like what is distortionless transmission line what is lossless transmission line okay and the different conditions what are the applications of the transmission lines like what sir how they will be what realizing or passive elements like a resistor inductor capacitor and similarly how it can be used as impedance matching okay we'll be seeing about smith chart and once we have done with that sir we'll be going to the word other part and the last part here is the wave guides we'll see there what's a wave guides means what is a wave guide what are the different type of wave guides with respect to the gates sir we have okay the most important is the rectangular wave guide which we have as a part of our syllabus and then we'll see the what's fundamentals of antennas and some what's a and one or two antennas which we have as a part of our syllabus so with that okay we'll be what finishing our basic what's a the syllabus related to or electromagnetic waves and transmission lines so in overall i can say that this chapter or so this subject is basically means needs much concentration and it there is a lot of analysis okay will be doing on it so everyone or so needs some attention much attention and concentration so that okay means is it is easy to understand that wave equations or it is easy to understand the several expressions which we write here and so that you can ever sir able to what answer the different type of questions and uh, the gate examination so that's how i can say okay what what sir the introduction and syllabus about this emt so let's what sir first begin with our name of our subject called <coughs> electromagnetic fields first of all let us define what is a field what is a field in general sir let us assume with respect to an electric charge i'm just taking let's say there's a plus q charge when there is a plus q charge present definitely this plus q charge will have its own effect until certain region so let us say sir its effect is now but confined to this region so whenever we bring let's say some other charge particle into this region whenever we bring other charge particle into this region so definitely the other charge particle will experience certain force that means so because of the field offered by our first charge what's happening or the second charge particle is getting experience certain force so that force may be attractive or repulsive but that depends on what sir the polarity of this charge so forget about the polarity here that means what we can understand there is certain force on this charge but whenever we what sir let's say get the same charge particle near to this then maybe again what sir the different amount of charge here the different amount of what I mean force will be there here means here it is experiences some magnitude of force let this point it experiences the different magnitude of force but whenever let's say we get the charge particle just or sir out of that boundary or out of this region so there is no what force experienced by this q1 charge that means we can understand the effect of this plus q charge is limited to this what's a entire region so this region we can call it as a field field simply we can define field is a region of convergence so field is a region of influence sorry field is a region of influence so wherever it has what's a influence of the charge particle the entire what's a region we are calling it as a field so basically when you look at that field sir so this field <coughs> this field having different magnitudes at different points in this region this is 
different magnitudes at different points. That means, just now we said before, that when we get a charged particle to this point, it experiences what's a, some force, but when, it, when we get the same charged particle near to the plus Q, the amount of force will be different. That means we can say, means this effect of the charged particle in this region has got different magnitudes at different points. So we can also define that field is a physical function, physical function which has different magnitudes at different points in a region. So that region we are calling it as what's a field. So if that field is produced by an electric charge, then we can call it as electric field. Or if that field is produced by what's a, a permanent magnet or, or some other effect, due to means due to a magnetic effect, we can call that field as a magnetic field. Magnetic field. So basically, field is a region of influence, where means that region has got some fi some physical function. That, fi that physical function has got different magnitudes at different points in that region. At certain point of the region, the effect of that field becomes zero. So that is said to be what's a, the boundary, the boundary of that field, boundary of that field. So that's how we can understand what is electric field, okay? And what is what's a, what is basically a field, and how does an electric field is produced, and how does a magnetic field is produced? So basically. The electric field with respect to now what we're talking about is produced by what's uh, the charge particles we are saying. And the magnetic field may be produced due to the permanent magnet or maybe due to what's uh, a current carrying conductor. Current carrying conductor. So basically, okay, these are called what's uh, electric and magnetic fields. All right. So coming to the what's uh, first part of our syllabus is nothing but electrostatics. Electrostatics. So, what is this electrostatics? <coughs> As the name itself indicates, electrostatics. This, this describes, or this is the analysis of stationary electric fields. Stationary electric fields. So, what is this stationary electric field when it is produced? So, normally, before I said, let's say there is a point charge plus Q is present at a point, and we said it offers means its region, it offers its effect until certain region is nothing but what's a, is a field. Suppose if that point charge is fixed to certain point, let's say the charge plus Q is fixed to the point P and it is not moving. So definitely it will have what's a, its field until it means until certain region and that field, yes, we can call it as stationary electric field. That means the stationary electric field is an electric field which is not varying with respect to the time. And when it will not vary with respect to the time, it will not vary with respect to the time provided the charge is not moving or the charge is fixed to certain position. So when the charge is fixed to certain position, definitely what sir, whatever the electric field produces around it is called simply stationary electric field. But if a charge is being moving, like this, let's say when it is moving, moving definitely what's a, we have means electric field which varies with respect to time at each and every point. Suppose let's say if you consider sir, when the charge is at this place, let us say sir, the field is means like this, and when it is moving, the field also moves along with it sir. Means if you look at at this point, initially we may have maximum magnitude for that effect of that what field, but when it is moving, means what happens sir? This magnitude at this point gets decreasing because it is going away from that point. That means the changing or so the moving charge particles will have what sir? A changing electric field will produce a change in electric field but when a charge particle is fixed to certain position that will always produce what sir? A static electric field. So that's why we say electrostatics, what does means if you look at the name Electrostatics is the analysis or it is the study of stationary electric fields. Study of stationary electric fields. That means uh, we understand that basically in electrostatics it is a study of stationary electric fields. Then what all we see as a part of this electrostatics? It's very simple. Means we all we are always interested 
means when the charged particles are fixed to certain position. So, due to that, what are the different effects we'll be getting? That we'll be analyzing, sir. So, uh, as a part of the entire electrostatics, the entire electrostatics, the charged particles are fixed to certain position. Never they are moving, okay? And we don't consider, what, sir, the time varying what electric field here. Electric field here, right? I hope now everyone understand what basically, okay, electrostatics and what is stationary electric field. Now, sir, let us see. Okay, we understood that basically a field is a region which will have its influence. Then how does a field can be described? Before also we said, whenever we bring a charge particle into this what's a region, it will experience certain force. Certain force, that means force. I said, depending on the polarity of the charge, the force may be either attractive or repulsive. That means the force has got certain direction. The electric field which is offering force has got certain direction. So that is why to understand better about a field, first we should know what sir, the basics of okay, vectors. So first we need what is a vector and how does, okay, means a vector field, what is a vector field, what is a scalar field, okay, and how this can be what's really applied with respect to the, okay, different fields, okay, we try to understand as a part of this, okay, vector analysis. That means, so let us begin to represent accurately a field because we said field has got certain magnitude and also it is what's having certain direction. The better it can be described using what's a, a vector. That's why most of the fields are in a real life, we can better analyze with respect to the vectors and especially coming to our what's a EMT subject also. So the fields can be analyzed sir, or most of the words are electric and magnetic fields which have got some specific direction, they can be analyzed best with respect to the vector analysis. So that is why initially we begin with the concepts of vectors, concepts of first vectors. And what is a vector, how a vector can be uh, <coughs> represented and what is a, what's a positional vector and what is also different operations performed on the vector size so in the beginning before in the syllabus, okay? So we'll see all of them and then, okay, with those fundamentals, we try to what, sir, discuss the different what aspects of our electrostatics, right? So first, let us begin with the concepts of, okay, vectors. Anything in our real life, normally, or most of the practical quantities can be quant quant sir, classified into the two types, call vectors and number two, scalars. Vectors and scalars. When we consider first the term vector, so what is a vector? What is a scalar? What are the different examples? Very simple. As the name itself indicates, I think you might have already been know as a part of your words of previous classes. So basically vector, vector, it is a quantity which has both magnitude and direction. Means when a quantity is being expressed with respect to certain magnitude and direction, sir, we can call that quantity as a vector. For example, for example, let us consider, sir, let us consider there is some object here which is what's moving like this. That is, it has displaced its position from here to here in this direction. That means the displacement here in sp some specific direction, okay, displacement has been obtained with respect to the object in certain direction which you can call it as what's a, a vector quantity, a vector quantity. Means basically a vector has got certain magnitude means it has what's a travel certain distance along some okay specific direction. So we are calling the displacement as a what's a vector. If the displacement is a vector. Similarly, the other terms which can be derived from the vector means the displacement also becomes oh, vectors. For example, a velocity, yes, you can call it as a vector. 
similarly what's a acceleration also we can call it as a vector but coming to the what's a next point scalars scalars then what is a scalar scalar it is a quantity which has only magnitude and there was no direction there was no direction which we can call it as a what's here scalar so that means any quantity which are just magnitude it's just said to be what's a, a scalar quantity and there is no direction importance given with respect to that for example let us consider sir, the mass mass or let us say temperature temperature when you look at temperature sir yes temperature is present at each and every point but there is no specific direction with respect to the temperature but consider the wind flow in certain area when you consider the wind flow in certain area yes wind wind flow may be what's it, some small or more in certain region but that is always having certain direction that means the wind flow you can call it as an example for what's a vector wind flow in a region can be what's an example of vector but when you consider temperature yes temperature sir there is no specific direction that we need not mention with respect to temperature temperature is distributed at each and every point but there is no specific direction with respect to the temperature can be considered so temperature can be basically treated as what's a scalar likewise what we can understand is simply means the quantities which have only magnitude is are called what's a scalars but the quantities which has magnitude as well as direction the direction is also specified with respect to some of the quantities which makes them what sir means most effective or which makes them means to understand what is that quantity really so that type of quantities we can call it as vectors vectors so now we understand what is a scalar and a vector sir how does a vector can be represented how does a vector can be written okay so if you see that A vector, sir, always starts at a point and moves in certain direction with an arrow mark. So basically, a vector can be indicated, means it can be written like this. But when we go for symbolic representation of this vector, how do we write? Let's say this is a point O, starting point, let's say O. Let's say this ending, what's a, this point is the terminating point, let's say A. So a vector between these two points O and A can be indicated as symbolically as O A bar. O A bar. So this is what's a, the representation of a vector. So between the two points, I've just indicated O and what's a, a. O is a starting and A is a terminating point. Then a vector can be represented like this. O A bar. Now. <coughs> You can give what's any convention for it. If you want to give certain name, let's say, suppose let's say if you want to give a name for it as or let's say the distance between O A is some R, you can give it as what's the representation as R bar. You can give the representation as R bar. Now, <coughs> means we just understood sir how a vector can be represented. That means we can understand basically vector is having what's a certain length, a certain magnitude, and also what's a moving in certain direction. So that is why. Basically, any quantity which has magnitude and direction, we are calling it as what's a vector. So, when you look at what is this magnitude of this vector, basically, it's very simple. The magnitude of the vector, we just indicate it like this. That is what's said. This magnitude of OA bar. Magnitude of OA bar is nothing but the length of the vector between these two points is nothing but its magnitude. What is that length we have what, taken it as, sir? The length we have taken it as R. The length we have taken it as what's r. So the magnitude of this vector is simply equals to the length of this vector. The length of this vector, right? So that's how we can see, sir, how a vector can be represented. Very simple point it is. Now, now, so let us see, sir, what is a positional vector, and how can we obtain a vector between two points? So first, okay. Let us consider the concept of positional vector. Positional vector. 
when you consider what's a positional vector how do we define first it is we define like this it is a vector between origin and any other point it is a vector between origin and any other point we can call it as what's a positional vector so for example before we have taken what's a, our o is a what point and starting point and a is our ending point suppose let us assume our o is origin sir which has the coordinates let us say some 0 0 0 just assume like rectangular coordinates let us say a is a point which has the coordinates let's say what's a here x comma y comma z that means we can say that this is a vector obtained between origin and what's a any other point so this is called now what's a positional vector positional vector so this we can indicate sir as we said like r bar positional vector o a bar is nothing but r bar is equals how do you obtain very simple so to obtain the vector what's a between origin and any other point simply how do we say is simply the x coordinate of a point minus the x coordinate of o point plus and what's a the direction along with that x means a unit vector which is used to represent the direction of what's a any coordinate along any coordinate axis so similarly the y coordinate of this a point minus the y coordinate of this o point into the unit vector along that y direction similarly plus z coordinate of our a point minus what's the z coordinate of our o point and the unit vector along that will represent simply our positional vector so now we say it as x minus 0 into a x bar plus y minus 0 into a y bar plus z minus 0 sorry a y bar into a z bar into a z bar that means the positional vector you can say x a x bar plus y a y bar plus z a z bar which is called the positional vector positional vector between what's a origin and any other point origin and any other point Okay, so now we understand what is positional vector. So simply we have taken that positional vector is always taken with respect to the origin. But let us say there is no origin, but if there are two points, they have been clearly defined, like let's say A point and B point here. Let us assume the coordinates of A points as x1, comma, y1, comma, z1, and the coordinates of B point as x2 comma y2 comma z2 x2 comma y2 comma z2 so the vector between these two points the vector between these two points so how it is indicated let's say the vector from a to b let's assume otherwise i think about a b bar a b bar how we obtain if you look at very simple so whatever the way we have done with respect to the positional vectors the same concept is even applicable when there is no presence of origin so how can we say so we can say just like this sir. simply the coordinates of what our ending point minus the coordinates of our starting point and the unit vectors along what our reference directions as x y and z will gives us always the vector between any two points between two points that means you can directly write it as so what is your starting point here the starting point at this word is a the terminating point is what here sir b that means so i said to obtain the vector between any two points so we have to subtract the coordinates of starting point from coordinates of our ending point okay vector ending point and we have to include all the unit vectors along those directions that means i'm just writing it as x2 minus x1 into a x bar plus y2 minus y1 into a y bar plus z2 minus z1 into a z bar a z bar is nothing but okay our vector between the two points the vector between any two points we can also express in terms of what's our positional vectors i can also say like this simply so I'm just writing AB bar as 
ओ बी बार माइनस इन टर्म्स ऑफ पोजिशन वेक्टर्स लाइक दिस ओ बी बार माइनस ओ ए बार वेन यू लुक एट सर ओ बी बार इट इज वेक्टर बिटवीन ऑरिजिन एंड बी पॉइंट एंड वॉट वी गेट नॉर्मली वी गेट इट एज वट सर बिकॉज ओ कोर्डिनेट्स आर जीरो 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 एंड और बी कोर्डिनेट्स आर एक्स टू वाई टू जेड टू एंड और ओ बी बार बिकम्स वॉट हियर एक्स टू माइनस जीरो इन टू ए एक्स बार दर मीन्स वी गेट एक्स टू ए एक्स बार प्लस वाई टू ए वाई बार प्लस जेड टू ए जेड बार Similarly, what we get the positional vector between O and A already we just understand that is x a x bar plus x one a x bar plus y one a y bar plus z one a z bar. But when you subtract those two positional vectors, sir, you'll be getting the vector between the two points here A and B. That means when we considered the vector between any two points, that can be also written in terms of the positional vectors like okay. So with respect to this example, a b bar. We can say that what's a o b bar minus o a bar, o b bar minus o a bar. So that's how we can understand. Okay. So how to obtain the vector between any two points, and what's a and what is the concept of here positional vector? Okay, positional vector. And I said this a x bar and a y bar and a z bar. Are the unit vectors along x, y, z direction? So now, how do we means call? What is a unit vector? What is a unit vector? We said basically vector has got magnitude and direction. But if I mention it as a unit vector, it's very simple. That the magnitude of that vector is unity or one. The magnitude of that vector is unity or one. Then how do we obtain the unit vector of okay? Unit vector related to any vector. So for example. Suppose if you look at sir, O A bar is okay, one vector which we have taken here, nothing but positional vector which we have indicated as R bar. And what is the magnitude of O A bar? We got it sir, the magnitude of O A bar we have taken it as R. So now the unit vector along that O A bar means I am just calling it as A O A bar. A O A bar is equals simply that vector, the vector divided by The magnitude of that vector, magnitude of that vector. That means here you can say our r bar by r becomes what's a the unit vector along okay O A direction. Our unit vector between the points here O and A. So simply when you divide any vector with its magnitude, definitely what is that overall magnitude becomes here is one. There is no change in direction. Just what is being affected here when you divide with the magnitude, the entire magnitude gets affected of that vector. So that type of vector here we call it as unit vector. So a vector which has what's a unity magnitude or unity magnet unity magnitude or magnitude as one we can call it as unit vector. And unit vectors sir always means indicate normally I said here in order to get a vector between these two points, so we indicated x coordinate into the what to indicate the direction of that vector along x. We have what sir use this unit vector. That means basically, unit vectors we just represent to indicate what sir the direction of every vector along any component, along any spatial coordinate, along any spatial coordinate. So now, I hope you understand that what is a vector, what is a positional vector, and how to obtain vector between two points, and what is unity vector. Now let us see sir the other fundamentals called The operations performed on the vectors. Operations performed on the vectors. Why I am saying what is its importance? If you see, very simple. Suppose if we consider addition of three or four vectors, just assume. Let's say we have to add three or four vectors. Let us consider. Let us consider a vector. Okay, a, this is a bar. Let us consider this is a vector b bar. Let us say this is another vector. C bar. Let's say this is another vector, D bar. So there are four vectors here we have sir, which has to be added. First of all, let us try to understand what is the importance of this vector addition. Why we have to see vector addition? How it is useful with respect to our electrostatics or magnetostatics? Very simple sir. Suppose let us say you are finding electric field intensity due to a point charge. Due to a point charge. So, when one point charge is present, yes, we can get electric field intensity at our required point. But when several point charges are present, 
let's say there are several charges present let's assume there is a q1 charge at this point and q2 charge at this point and q3 charge present and q4 charge and q5 charge i would like to find the electric field intensity at this point due to the several charges due to the several charges i have to find the electric field intensity at this point due to the several point charges so our electric field intensity the total electric field intensity is nothing but the vector sum of vector sum of all individual electric fields which will be what's a causing due to the individual charges let us say the electric field intensity at this point is even due to the what's a q1 charge and similarly let let's say it's even and let's say it's e2 let's say it's e3 let's say it's e4 and let's say it's e5 that means when we have to find the electric field intensity at a point due to the several charges and just now we understand that the electric field intensities due to the individual charges are e1 e2 e3 e4 e5 at our required point so the net or the total electric field intensity at my required point is simply how do we say the sum of their individual values but when you look at these field quantities sir e1 and e3 e4 all of these are the vector quantities electric field is a vector quantity because just before we understand that the field will also exert certain force on the charge depending on the polarity of charge the force may be repulsive or attractive that means the electric field which is offering certain force has got certain direction so the electric field intensity at any point sir will means at any point due to the several charges what we can say it is a vector sum of all these individual individual electric field intensities that means in order to evaluate this what we have to understand means we have to understand sir how a vectors can be added how a vectors can be added and what is that okay when you add the five vectors and what is that resultant vector direction will be how do we indicate so that is obtained using what's our vector sum likewise there are several what's a fields or several what's a problems we can see v means problems we can see where we add several vectors and we performs various operations on the vector vector quantities to answer different type of even gate problems so that is why means every topic whatever we are discussing now having certain application with respect to what's our concepts so that's why we say all these are the fundamentals or the prerequisites to begin with the concepts of our electromagnetics that is why so we are just going what's through each and everything now i hope everyone understand what is the importance of this addition of the vectors now let us see sir how to add these vectors how to add these vectors i have taken four vectors here one vector is a bar b bar c bar and d bar i have taken four vectors sir i have to what now add or i have to get the final result uh, means a resultant vector which is the sum of all these a bar plus b bar plus c bar plus d bar i need the sum of these four vectors first of all let us see how to perform the addition of two vectors try to understand how to add the two vectors when we consider addition of the two vectors very simple so first let us consider our a bar and b bar a bar and b bar i am just first trying to get addition between a bar and b bar nothing but a bar plus b bar first i am trying to get from these two let's say i am just trying to add these two first so what is our resultant sum becomes sir our sum will be a bar plus b bar now how do we get it very simple to perform addition of two vectors to perform addition of two vectors take any one vector take any one vector move that vector parallel to itself move that vector parallel to itself at the another tip of the second vector or at the tip of our second vector and join the starting point and the ending point you will be getting what's a, the resultant or addition of the two vectors sir what exactly it means is very simple let us say sir means i am keeping our a bar as it is i am keeping our a bar as it is 
Now I am taking a b bar. What I said, in order to perform the addition of these two vectors, just take any one vector, move that vector parallel to itself at the tip of another vector, at the tip of another vector. That means now I am taking a bar as it is. I am not moving any, I am not going any changes for it. But I am what now taking b bar and what I am doing, I am just moving b bar parallel to itself at the tip of another vector. That means this is a bar. When you look at this tip and this is a, this is a starting tip. Now what is ending tip for this or terminating tip for a bar is this one. So at this tip, I am starting our b bar and moving parallel to itself. How does our b bar? b bar will be like this. Now let's say I am just moving our b bar parallel to itself. Now join this starting of our first vector and the ending of our second vector means these two points. So this will become, this will become addition of the two vectors called a bar plus b bar. a bar plus b bar. So that's how we can understand how to words add the two vectors. Once again, I am concluding. So in order to perform the addition of two vectors, just take one vector, move parallel to itself at the tip of another vector, at the tip of another vector, then join the starting and what ending points. Then you will be getting what the sum of the two vectors, nothing but a bar plus b bar, a bar plus b bar. So now similarly, because here I have given four vectors. So how can you proceed using this rule is very simple. You can proceed like this. So first you can perform the addition of what's a a bar plus b bar. That means you will be getting a resultant vector of a bar plus b bar. Treat that a bar plus b bar as a single vector and then go for what's the addition of this a bar plus b bar and c bar and follow again the similar procedure. That means again to perform here we have understand how to get the addition of the two vectors like a bar and b bar. Next I am going for, let's say sir, the addition of a bar plus b bar and c bar. Addition of a bar plus b bar and c bar. So just now I got the result of this a bar plus b bar is nothing but this. Now I am taking this a bar plus b bar as a single vector, and this is our a bar plus b bar. Now I am moving c bar parallel to itself at the another tip of a bar plus b bar and joining the starting and ending points using the same procedure, I will be getting what's a, now the sum of these okay, three vectors like a bar plus b bar plus c bar. That means, let's see how I am doing that. <coughs> so here I just got it before this is a bar and this is, sorry, this is our b bar and we got this as a bar plus b bar. Now, that means our a bar plus b bar is this vector. Now I am just getting the addition a bar plus b bar plus c bar. So how I am getting is very simple. I've, so I am just following the same procedure. That means I am taking c bar at the another tip of a bar plus b bar means at this point and moving that c bar parallel to itself moving that c bar parallel to itself because c bar looks like this okay i'm just moving parallel to itself now join the starting point of this a bar plus b bar and ending point of our c bar so this becomes our what's sir the resultant vector a bar plus b bar plus c bar a bar plus b bar plus c bar similarly the same concept you can even follow for what's a d bar also that means this is the resultant vector of a bar plus b bar plus c bar. Now let us say I would like to get a bar plus b bar plus c bar plus d bar. If it is a bar plus c bar plus d bar, again same, I am taking now d bar moving parallel to itself at the another tip of a bar plus b bar plus c bar. Nothing but this is our a bar plus b bar plus c bar. This is starting tip, this is ending tip. At this tip I am moving d bar parallel to itself parallel to itself and joining the starting and ending tip of these two, I will be getting now what's here, a bar plus b bar plus c bar plus d bar, d bar. So that's how we can understand sir, simply how to add multiple vectors.
means there is only one point here we can understand that in order to perform addition of any two vectors simply simply take any one vector move that vector parallel to itself at the another tip of the vector and join the starting and ending points will be getting what's the sum of the two vectors likewise you can extend the concept to any number of vectors any number of vectors so this is one of the way to perform addition of the two vectors there is another way also we have so especially when we go for addition of two vectors is called the second rule is called parallelogram rule parallelogram rule so very simple here i think you might have heard what is parallelogram what is parallelogram that means parallelogram has got four sides where the two opposite sides are parallel to each other that means it will be like this the four sides we have got sir a b c d but the two opposite sides are parallel to each other these are parallel to each other and they are also what's here parallel to each other so don't mention using direction so in overall we can say basically parallelogram is a quadrilateral which has four sides where the two what's opposite sides are parallel to each other similarly what we are saying that rule with respect to the vectors is very simple if the two vectors represents the two adjacent sides of a parallelogram then the sum of the two vectors is nothing but the diagonal which is coming out of those two adjacent sides represents the sum of two vectors that means let us say i am taking so let's say means a vector which is along the side ab bar let's assume as like this let's say it's some a bar let's assume let and consider a vector along the side ad i'm just taking let's say sir here is some b bar let's assume it as a b bar let's say the common okay point here starting point let's say o that means the first vector i am taking as one of the side of this parallelogram which represents along the length of the ab the other vector i am taking what sir uh, the other vector i am taking along the side ad let us say that means the, along the ab side i am just calling the vector as a bar and along the ad side i am calling that vector as b bar so now we can say that these two vectors represents the two adjacent sides of this parallelogram when the two vectors represent the two adjacent sides of this parallelogram simply the diagonal which is coming out of as a common adjacent for this the diagonal which is coming out of these two adjacent sides is nothing but this one so which will represent what's here which will represent here or addition of the two vectors is nothing but a bar plus b bar a bar plus b bar and similarly you can also even treat sir with respect to what ba and with respect to even bc also okay bc also similarly suppose let's say if i take a vector like this along the length of bc let's say one more vector like this along the length of what's it will well, along the length of ba let's say i have taken like this along the length of our let's say bc is like this just can't see here and one more vector is like this suppose let us assume sir it is a c bar and it is a d bar just assume then we can say our c bar represents one of the side and d bar represents the other side of parallelogram then the diagonal which is coming out of this the diagonal which is coming out of this is nothing but what here c bar plus d bar c bar plus d bar c bar plus d bar so that's how we can understand so here okay basically how the parallelogram rule can be applicable just i'm saying once again in parallelogram rule if the two vectors represents if the two vectors represents the two adjacent sides of a parallelogram then the diagonal coming out of those two adjacent sides will represent the diagonal coming out of those two adjacent sides will represent what's the sum of the two vectors that is called parallelogram rule parallelogram rule as sir one of our students saurav is asking so moving parallel to itself okay what exactly it means very simple what is moving parallel to itself you can consider this a bar and 
b bar. These are the two vectors. Let's say once again I'm drawing here. Just consider this is a bar. Let us say this is b bar. This is b bar. a bar and b bar. Now what I said, in order to perform addition of these two, take any one vector, let's say I'm taking b bar, and moving that vector b bar parallel to itself. That means, however the way that b bar is oriented, similarly you just try to so draw the b bar at the another tip of a bar, at the another tip of a bar, okay? That means like this means I have the similar to that B bar, the same B bar I just drawn what's the, the parallel to itself, parallel to itself at the another tip of A bar and by joining these two, by joining these two, what I'll be getting the sum of the two vectors. That exactly means moving a vector parallel to itself, parallel to itself, parallel to itself. So which is called what's the here? means addition of the two vectors. I hope Savro now you got it, okay? Just means take any vector, just draw the same vector otherwise. Moving parallel to itself means draw the same vector, parallel to means same vector at the another tip of the first vector and join the starting and ending points, you'll be getting the sum of the two vectors, sum of the two vectors. So that is called what's here? Vectors addition. I hope everyone understand, okay? So what is vectors addition? Vector addition using what's the parallelogram rule and using the what's the moving a vector parallel to itself at the another tip of the vector okay at the another tip of the vector right now let us <coughs> now let us move on to the other operation called vector addition i hope everyone understand the next one is vectors scaling scaling of a vectors scaling of vectors now I'm taking, let's say, sir, scaling of vectors. In general, what do you think about scaling, sir? Scaling means, scaling means, just multiplying a vector with certain constant, multiplying a vector with certain constant is called scaling of a vector. Now, when you're multiplying a vector with certain constant, so what are the terms will be affected? Because we're saying it is multiplied with a constant. That means definitely the magnitude of the vector will be affected. There is no doubt in that. But depending on that constant value, that is the nature of that constant value, we can say the direction is also affected. The direction is also affected. <coughs> so means we should see, sir, so for what constants its magnitude will be affected. For what constants, its direction will be affected. Its direction will be affected. So when you consider, sir, let us assume that this is a vector. This is a vector. Let us assume this is a vector A bar. Let us say I am just calling alpha A bar is nothing but scaling of a vector. Scaling of a vector. That means I just multiplied this a bar with certain constant alpha, certain constant alpha. I am calling this alpha a bar. This is nothing but scaling of a vector. Now, let us consider the different values of alpha. Let us consider the different values of alpha so that we understand how exactly the magnitude can be affected and also how exactly the direction can be affected. Suppose, let us say, if alpha is greater than 1, for all values of alpha which is greater than 1, that means what happens, suppose for example, let us say alpha is equals 2, alpha is equals 2. So when alpha is equals 2, that means what is our, what's alpha a bar becomes? Our alpha a bar becomes 2 a bar. Our alpha a bar becomes 2 a bar, nothing but original vector is a bar. Now, after scaling of the factor 2, we got it as 2 a bar. That means the vector magnitude or the vector length will be doubled. 
but there is no change in direction. That means our 2a bar will be like this. Our 2a bar will be like this. So when you compare these two, you can see, sir, definitely this vector length is two times of what, sir? It means our original vector. But there is no change in direction. It is also moving in this direction. And also it is also oriented in the same direction. So that means here, when we have taken an alpha, which is greater than 1, you take any value greater than 1, it always improves that magnitude or increases the magnitude of the vector, that, but that will not affect its direction. Similarly, let us consider, let's say alpha is less than 1. When you take alpha less than 1, so when alpha becomes less than 1, so let us assume, sir, for example, that alpha less than 1, I am taking it as, let's say alpha value, I am taking it as some 0.5, let's say. When alpha becomes 0.5, our alpha a bar becomes 0.5 a bar. So what do you mean by 0.5 a bar? Again, same. That means the length of that vector will be reduced by what's a half. Means it will become, means just instead of this a bar, what we have said, now 0.5 a bar just becomes like this. Just the vector word magnitude will become half. That means in both the cases, when we have scaled by the factor greater than 1, or when we have what's a scaled by the factor less than 1, what's happening here, sir? So definitely, means I've taken both the scaling factors as positive but not negative. But what we can understand here, means when we have multiplied for greater than 1 with a positive factor, means its magnitude will be improved. And when we multiply what, sir? Less than 1, which is again a positive factor, what happens, sir? It will be decreased. The magnitude gets decreased. Similarly, now let us assume, sir, alpha is equals, let us say I'm taking minus 1. Let's say I'm taking alpha is equals minus 1. When I take alpha is equals minus 1 here, okay, that means <coughs> when alpha is equals minus 1, then <coughs> that a bar becomes, look at this, our alpha a bar becomes now, that means there is no change in magnitude. When alpha is equals minus 1, alpha a bar becomes minus a bar. So here the term minus indicates, here the term minus indicates, okay, minus indicates simply what, sir, the direction of that vector gets reversed. The direction of that vector gets reversed. That means it will be like this. The same magnitude will be having, but the vector moving in opposite direction. The vector moving in opposite direction. Similarly, if you multiply for minus 2 or minus 3, definitely what happens, sir? Yes, means there is a proportional increase in length, but that means pointing in opposite direction. That means when you multiply all negative values other than minus 1, yes, definitely what sir, there is a magnitude change in addition to that the direction change. But when you multiply with just minus 1, what happens is the same vector will having the same length and same magnitude, but the direction will be changing here. Direction will be changing. So this is called what sir, scaling of a vector scaling of a vector. I hope you understand everyone. So that's how now we can see sir how to add the two vectors means how to perform the vector addition and about what sir scaling of vectors. Right. We break for five minutes and then okay we come back.